My name is Linda Lindquist. I'm with the Master Gardeners of Rutherford County, and most of you know that because you're Master Gardener. Uh, well, not most. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk today about fall containers. Um, part of it, you get a door price ticket. This is very informal, and uh, I make most of it up as I go along. If you have any questions or comments or experiences to share, we really like to hear the support we learn from each other in these classes. It's very but um, the reason we're going to talk about fall containers is uh, if you're like me, I've, I've planted some pots in the summer or in the spring, had a great time with them, but it's been the hottest summer in decades. And every day, if you didn't water it constantly, Everything's looking pretty puny by now. And it would anyway. You know, once September, maybe we're a few weeks before the normal puny period, but um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's start, these annuals that we put in our containers, they have a certain lifestyle. They only live a year, so you expect them to die. Um, but there's that period between now and when we decorate for the holidays where everything just looks blah because all your annuals have died, your perennials have quit blooming, and when you walk up your front porch and your back porch or wherever you have your containers, it's just, it's just nothing. So we were trying to think of, you know, what can we do besides the, the uh, chrysanthemums that are already out for sale. Um, ornamental cabbage will be out soon, and pansies and violas will be out soon. The reason they're not out yet is they require a little bit cooler weather to survive. But um, most of us, we're seeing things like this at the garden center already. And how many of you have bought chrysanthemums in the past and way before Halloween and certainly before Thanksgiving? All you've got are some dried up stumps. You know, that happens to all of us because they just don't bloom that long. They don't last that long. But we're going to talk about some ways to not only make them survive a little bit longer, give you a little longer life on your pots, but also some ideas outside the chrysanthemum that, uh, that we can do. Um, before I start showing you some ideas for containers, I wanted to show you how to properly plant a container. Uh, if you do buy, let's just say if you do buy chrysanthemums or any, anything, this is generic for anything you use. You want to use a, a good size container. This is small to me, but I didn't really want to carry the big one that I would normally plant it at home. It gets heavy and my shoulder hurts. So um, this is one of the foam containers, and they're very nice, especially for the winter, because they provide a little layer of insulation, uh, so that if you do uh, have perennials in here, we'll talk about that, they get a little bit of insulation and not a slightly freezing night. It'll we'll survive a little longer. So they're pretty nice, but you can use anything you want. You can use terracotta. Um, we're going to plant this one. It's in a, a wash tub. It, it really doesn't matter, but you want to have a good size so that you have a good amount of soil around your plant uh, to give the roots some support and, and uh, nutrition. The main thing you want in a container of any kind is a drainage hole. These are very easy to put drainage into. You can just poke it with an ice pick, a nail, a screwdriver, a drill. You just need a drainage hole. A quarter inch or larger. You don't want it to be too large because uh, you don't want the soil to seep out. You can put them in the bottom, two or three, or you can put them in the back of your pot. And that, that's kind of what I like. That way it's not um, sitting in the water so much, but it drains out. The excess water will drain out the back of the, the pot. This one does not have drainage in it, but we're going to pretend it does. Uh, after you've got your drainage hole uh, put in your pot, you want to put something over it that uh, will keep the soil from washing out and also keep the roly polies and the ants and other things from going in. So uh, a coffee filter is good, a piece of paper towel, a line of newspaper, that all works well. It'll disintegrate over time, but this isn't permanent. This is just for the season. Um, and it will last through a couple seasons. So put a piece of, uh, I like coffee filters. They seem to last longer. Put that in the bottom against your purple and then fill it with a good potting soil. We do not use gravel. We do not put park shards in it. We don't have to put it. Uh, oh, please don't put styrofoam peanuts in it. Um, 
You don't have to put anything in there for drainage because your hole is the drainage. That's where the water comes out. And what we're finding, one thing about being a master gardener is, is University of Tennessee and Extension are always giving us new, updated, research-based information. And what they're finding is if you fill your pot, if this were a larger pot, with uh, packing peanuts or gravel or whatever to provide what we think in our heads we've been told drainage, all you're doing is creating a, a, a reservoir of water down there that when your roots grow through the soil, they hit that water and then they, you get root rot and the plants don't thrive. So you're better off to have it full of soil and let it drain out the sides or back. Um, everybody with me so far? Okay. So that's preparing your pot. Good, good quality potting soil. Uh, fill that up with that and, and no gravel or uh, filler in there. Oh, the other reason people use filler, uh, especially packing peanuts, is so it's lighter weight. I don't know about you. I don't care this everywhere I go. It's wherever I put it, it's going to stay there. So the fact that it's not, you, you know, you're not reducing the weight that much. And you're not going to be moving them around. The best idea if you have a very large pot is to prepare it where you're going to add it so you don't have to move it. So if you're going to put a pot on your front porch, put it together on your front porch. Um, that way you don't have to worry about moving it. But what if your wife tells you to move it? Then you, got it. <laughs> you get the dolly out and you move it. <laughs> um, one thing about the chrysanthemums that we see in the market now, they've been grown for this season and this season alone. And generally, if you tease the plant out, you will see this is root. Um, if, a, if you see a plant like this, see on the bottom where the roots are all? Uh, the water, when you water, it's just going to drain right out. And it's not going to stay in the soil around the roots because there's not very much soil here. So the first thing to make a uh, chrysanthemum that you buy this year lasts a little bit longer is to take it out of the nursery pots and pot it. Uh, you want to pot it. This would be about the right size if you were just using this chrysanthemum because it's just about two inches bigger than the root ball itself. And when you do pot any plant and you take it out, uh, you want to check the roots. And these are all nice and white and healthy. They're in good shape. If they were black but smelled bad, you wouldn't want to buy that plant. And at the nursery, you can pull this out and look at it and check the health of your plant. If they don't let you do that, there's a reason. So no good nursery should have a problem uh, with you checking the root system. Uh, the way to get the roots to come out and uh, start growing into the new soil that you're going to plant around it, it's just to rough it up a little bit. I don't know if you can see it, but where it was a smooth wall here, now the roots are starting to come out a little bit. We call it teasing the roots. Or if it's a big plant, you could actually pinch into it. And um, you don't want to destroy the roots because that's what takes up the nutrients and water. But a little bit of help won't hurt it. And if it's very, very root bound down here, this is on the verge, I would pull these roots out. Now look, all that can grow down into the soil and get the nutrients that we're going to provide for it. And before, they would have just been growing in a circle and not doing anything. Do you have a favorite potting soil? Um, if I'm doing it in the spring, when I'm doing a lot of potting, I'll mix my own. I'll buy a good quality uh, potting soil um, without fertilizer in it and I'll, I'll mix about two-thirds of that or a third of that and then I'll mix peat moss with it and compost and mix that all together. I keep a big plastic trash can in my garage and, and I mix it up in that. Monica knows that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that way I've got a soil that the peat moss component lightens the soil and it's also water retention. So when I do water it, 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 it will hold that water longer and not drain out so fast. And the compost is just full of nutrients. You can buy compost or you can make your own. That's a whole other class. But if I'm in a hurry, I'll just buy a bag of compost and um, mix that in there. And it's full of nutrients. It also provides more organic material in your soil. I do use the you know, potting mix. I've got it today, the miracle Grow with, with fertilizer in it. There's nothing wrong with that. 
uh, buy the best potty soil you can afford. If you buy the dollar bags uh, on, at uh, you know, the discount stores, you're not getting great soil. You're, you're getting the second or third run of the process. A lot of times it's sludgy. And you see that when you open it up, there's almost a film on it. So that's not the best, uh, best source for your, your plants. Um, and the reason you don't have to buy soil with uh, the fertilizer in it, it, it's an extra help, but you're going to fertilize it anyway. They can only take it. It's like us taking vitamin C. There's so, only so much our bodies can absorb. And, and when we reach the max, we just slough it off. Well, the plants don't need more is not necessarily better, but enough is good. So um, we fill this with soil. Pep is in here. You always want to allow about an inch from the top of the plant to the top of the soil so that when you water it, the water runs into the soil, not off the edge of the plant. And, you know, at your basic, you've got a pot is your sample on that. But we're going past that. The, the big three plants uh, for fall are um, Besides moms, like I said, we have kales, um, there we go. pansies and kales are ornamental cabbages. These are all great. Uh, they provide variety in your, in your environment and, and you can get some nice design elements with it. They all pretty much get potted the same way. You can mix and match, do whatever you want. We'll have some examples. Let's talk a little bit about buying chrysanthemums. And you've got, this is on your handout uh, with a little more detail. But the first thing to make them last longer is to repot them. Use a good quality soil, make sure it has drainage, break up the roots, and water them. The number one reason that your chrysanthemums don't thrive is they're not watered enough. Once they get droopy, this one's on the verge. Um, and if you lift the pot, you feel it's a little lot, it needs watering. Once they get droopy, they're dying. And chrysanthemums are not forgiving. You can bring them back a little bit, but they're never going to be what they were. So some of these pots, if you don't repot them and they're root down and the water just runs right out, you got to water them twice a day. I don't want to do that. I'm a lazy gardener. Um, so repotting will help you have more moisture retained around that root ball. And you want to put them where they get four hours of more sunshine a day. Um, these are, these are full sun plants, so they'll take some shade, but they've got to have at least four hours of sun. They are not indoor plants. They won't survive with them indoors. Don't let them dry out, and as I said on the paper, number two rule is don't let them dry out. When you buy your chrysanthemums, <clears throat> you want to look for this type, the, the unopened buds. If they're already in full bloom, they're already on the way out and you're, you've lost at least two weeks of, of beauty with that plant. The nice thing about it, I bought this last night, it's about half and half. I would, it's okay, but I would prefer it if all the buds were either not opened or small like that, because this would last well as a Halloween then. You want them to be open just enough. You can see up here there's a little red. You can see what color they're going to be, because you can't rely on the plant bags. People move them around. But, uh, you know, just enough to know what color it's going to be so you can choose that, but not fully open. The stores sell them fully open because that's what people buy. You know, they just... A lot of the stores, uh, nurseries and big box stores both, they're, they're marketing to what the consumer wants. It's not necessarily what's best for that plant at that time. Nothing wrong with that, but you just end up buying more chrysanthemums, which maybe that's what they want. <laughs> so. When you buy pansies, uh, it also includes jumping jacks and violas. They're a little bit smaller than pansies, but they're in the same family. They like full to partial sun, so they would mix well with chrysanthemums because they both like sun. Water them at least once a week. They're a little more forgiving. They, if they dry out a little bit, they'll bounce back, but uh, don't overwater them. Don't let the uh, pot sit in a saucer full of water either. They're prone to root rot. They get too wet. And you want to fertilize them once a week. We'll talk about fertilizer later. 
they require a lot of energy. Moms, moms have been fed and grown by the nursery trade. They've got everything they've got in, in them. So fertilizing them more is not going to make them last longer, but pansies will. And you want to deadhead them. Deadheading, you don't know when, when the bloom of any plant uh, dries up and isn't uh, viable anymore. You, you pinch it off, and, and that's deadheading. And when you do that, you're sending a signal down to the plant to make more blooms. So that's why deadheading helps bring your plants up. And pansies are a plant that uh, while your chrysanthemum will die and freeze eventually and have to be replaced with something else. If you take care of pansies, they'll freeze when we get the really cold weather, but in the spring they'll come back. And if you fed them and watered them and they, they have enough energy to come back on, you'll have a nice showing until it's time to put your summer annuals in your pot. If anybody has anything that questions what I say or other experience, please let me know. What kind of fertilizer do you I like, um, when I'm put, preparing my pots, I, I like the, the, the spoma, I can't say it very well. It's an organic fertilizer, uh, so you really can't over-fertilize, and it's plant food. It's the generic one, all-purpose plant food. They sell different varieties. They'll have uh, acid and vegetable garden and all that, but this is a good generic, almost empty plant food. Uh, you can get it anywhere. Uh, the nurseries all have it still. Lowe's and, and big box stores, they're, they're getting their seasonal out now, so you probably won't find it there. Uh, Walmart carries it in the spring, so you can get it everywhere. But right now, you know, you want to look at your local nurseries, they have it all year long. I also like the Osmocote, the uh, granular that you put in there, and you put a spoonful in the bottom of your planting hole. That, that's a good long-term fertilizer. Um, but I like to mix my long-term and short-term fertilizers. That way they've always got uh, food that they need. The other of the big three for fall planting is the ornamental cabbages and kales. These are gorgeous plants. They've got the rosettes. Uh, they come in a multitude of shades of pinks, purples, and whites, and greens. Uh, so they're really good accents. They're, they're very exotic. And, and I love this with them planted close together and the ivy coming out of it. They like a sunny location, a moderately moist, rich soil. So all three of these like sun, good soil, enough water. The thing that uh, most people make a mistake when they plant um, the ornamental cabbages. Has anybody ever done tried these? Yeah. Um, they put them out. They don't come onto the market until it's starting to get cold and they put them outside right away, and they go in the shock, and they curl up and die. Uh, you want to harden them off, just like you do the seedlings that you're growing in the spring. Take them out for a few hours, bring them in, for, just for two or three days. Let them get used to the cold weather. They will thrive if you do that. Um, if, you, if you put them out all at once and they freeze, and you have really hard cold snap, they're, they're not going to do well, and you'll start getting some damage at the bottom leaves and they'll just grow a tall stalk and you end up with a pretty flower on a tall stalk and they can end up with it. But so, so climatize them. Buy the biggest rosette. These, these heads, they don't actually make heads like a cabbage. They call this the rosette. Buy the biggest one you can. These have, again, been grown for the nursery tree. And they're not meant to be planted outdoors long term. They won't come back. They're not going to grow much more than what you buy them. So you can plant them very close together like they are in that pot. Um, and, and when you build your pot, remember that you don't have to allow root. They're, they're going to stay pretty much what you bought. Until we get the first frost, you have to look for cabbage numbers. Um, that's the great thing about fall planting, is most of the spring insects have frozen out and gone. So you don't have to worry about them. But uh, late fall, we can still have some cabbage loopers. And you'll see them eating holes in the leaves. And if you see that, you want to put um, some, take some insecticidal treatment, you know, insecticidal soap, pick them off, uh, cover them until you get the first frost, and then you protect them from that. And these uh, don't require a lot of water, but they do need to be watered when the soil is dry to the touch. And the best way to gauge water in a container, whether it needs water, is just use your finger, 
in the soil, and if it's dry down to about the first knuckle, it probably needs watering. Okay, we'll leave it there. Continue on with containers. Any questions about those three so far? Do these attract bees? Uh, the monks will. Uh, they're not high nectar producing plants, but uh, when the bees are hungry, they'll 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 come up to them, but not a great deal. They're not nectar producing. So uh, the pansies might do more, but I haven't known either one of them would be promoted as a pollinator source. So you could call it either a flower garden or a bee garden. You could. You could. You could have no bee garden. <laughs> Butterflies, as the, until it gets cold enough that they're not flying, uh, they'll, they'll light on them as well. See if I got everything I wanted to say. Okay. So let's uh, let's put a pot together and start showing you a little bit about that. <coughs> Fall because your plant palette, your choices are somewhat limited. You have to get a little more creative. And, uh, and think about color and texture, um, and your container becomes more important. <coughs> so I've chosen uh, this slide up, and it holds a good amount of soil. I put a couple of drainage holes in it to protect it from that. Green, D 
deep purple, bright green. This one um, is called caramel coral bells. The more sun it gets, the more this caramel color will fall out. That's <coughs> so rough right now because it's, it's getting into that season, but it will hold its foliage all summer, all winter long. Uh, so you've got this color all winter long, uh, and it makes a nice contrast. Is that a perennial? It's a perennial, and um, when you're tired of it in your container, it goes in your yard. And again, nice root ball. A uh, lot. It's a deeper root ball, so I'm going to make a bigger hole. And I think I'm going to put this in the front. Okay. You want to make sure your container is deep enough to hold the root ball that you have. And if it's not, you can take part of this off because it's not going fully down in here. Just do it gently so you're not pulling roots. But you can see the roots being exposed. And this is a little bit dry. But for our purposes. I'm going to tilt that forward a little bit. Now for your winter containers, one thing to keep in mind are your fall containers. It's going to get cold. You want to provide some insulation to the roots, especially for these perennials that you want to keep and put in your yard later. So in the summer when you plant, you can plant right up to the edge of your container because there's roots around, or soil around the root, and that's fine. But in the winter, you want to allow at least an inch. I don't know if you can see it. But I'm not planting right up to the edge of the container. I'm allowing that buffer. That way it provides a little more insulation uh, when it does get cold. And it should I leave it out after it freezes. That way the roots won't freeze so badly. So um, let's put this aster in. This is a fall plant, but it will grow in your yard. Um, it's a perennial. You start seeing it in the fall. Its best color comes out in the fall. So if you're outside plants, your, your flower gardens and things are looking a little dull. Asters are great because they don't come into their own until the fall. But they make a good container plant as well. This one's got roots growing at the bottom, so it's a little harder. You want to be gentle when you pull them out. There we go. Ooh, root down. Really root down. Save your plant tags because everybody says, well, what is that in there? You've thrown them away. I keep them in a Ziploc baggie, and that way I've always got them, especially if I'm going to keep the plant. So I would tease this again. I'm not going to do it too much because I'm going to pop these back in the containers when I go home. And this is a pretty tall plant, so I'm going to put it in the bag. If I were making this pot where it would be viewed from all sides, I would work more from the middle. This is showing this as if you're just going to see it walking up to it. Doing that. And then, let's see. Put some texture on this side with the fern. Um, even an herb, rosemary. I like that. It's not too big. Rosemary's do well in containers, full sun. And you can put these off and use them in your food as, as you're making your Thanksgiving and Christmas meals. Or maybe your wife's cooking. And then I bought a small chrysanthemum. This was $2. You know, instead of spending $30 for a big one, um, or $40 or $50, I just bought this little one for 2 bucks, And you get all that nice color in here. You can see it's root bound. Not too much dirt in here, but you guys get the idea. You have to put paper on it on the side. I'm sorry? Put the paper on the side. Oh, the tag? Thank you. Thank you. Got better eyes out there. So I would normally plant that a little deeper. All right, now you've got some good texture, color. This will stay green, this will grow, this will die, this will die, this will grow. Um, so what do you do when you have that? Well, you can either replace them with more plants. Uh, as I said, this is going to get you too close to your Christmas decorating. So by then you're going to do something else. But I might leave these out on, on my porch all winter and add some cut branches from the Christmas trees or some holly. Um, or even some silk poinsettias or something, you know, to give it color. You know, there's the plant police won't come by and tell you 
you've got artificial mixed with your real stuff and give you a ticket or you, know, you can do what you want. And talking about that, let's give it some fall color. You can use a real pumpkin, you can use a, a butternut squash or a gourd or something. And now you've got a nice fall planting. And this will last you well into uh, the holiday season. Any questions about the container? The cypress, when you get to the point where you're ready to put it in your yard, how big will that get? Is that a miniature or is that a regular? This, uh, well, that's one thing. Uh, watching, <coughs> reading your plant tags is important. Um, here it is. This will, this is slow growing. It will eventually get five to six feet tall. So if you're buying it for, for that purpose, you want to make sure you have a spot that you want to eventually put it. But it's going to take seven years to get to that um, on this one. Now, this will stay if you read the plant tag. It may get a little wider, but it won't get much bigger than this ever. So read your plant tags. Um, on my front porch, I have two slow-growing small boxwoods in containers. And they stay there. They're in the center, and I just change what goes around them seasonally. And they're about this tall, and, the, and they're, uh, I forgot the species, but they'll only get this tall. So they're good permanent plantings for a container. But, but your plant tags are important. Uh, it will tell you what kind of sun it needs, what temperatures it's good to. This one has a cold hardiness of minus 30, so it'll it'll last all winter just fine. Uh, it likes full sun, moderate watering. It tells you how it grows, and then it tells you how to feed it. So plant tags are really key to it. Now, if you don't have a plant tag, ask your nursery to give you one. They can print them off off their database. So. Um, just as some other alternatives, say I didn't want to use that or it got too big and I wanted to put it in something else. There's some other plants that you can use. This is Japanese forest grass and I would buy it just for the name. It just sounds, it just sounds, <laughs> now that's a big, big root ball and I would probably have to cut it down, but now this gives it a different texture and a different color in there. So, and I'll tell you right now, the independent nurseries um, have all their perennials like this on half price sale. Uh, the big box stores, and, and I'm not against them, some people may say things, but they're, they, they're just done. Everything's gone back to the supplier. But the independent nurseries, they have to sell what they've got. So Martin's, uh, South Branch, Valley Growers, They've all got half price sales right now. So I think I paid uh, five dollars for this and it would have been ten something. So. Another uh, plant that, that I love are the sedges. We all go buy those spiky things for our containers and then they die because they're annuals. Or you can buy an ornamental grass or sedge and it does the same thing. But it doesn't die on you with the first frost. But you know, that's got it's, it is uh, showing its seasonal color here. But with fall, what do we use? Browns, oranges. So uh, that's good for me. <coughs> Just thinking outside um, the norm. Here's a fern. If you like ferns, that can give it a nice look. And you do have to watch your ferns. Some don't last through the winter, but read your tag, it will tell you if it's a cold party, and you can get some nice display on that. That goes in the yard later. Yeah, I like to recycle this. And then if you wanted a different texture or color from, from this one, see, it's like playing in the dark. <laughs> 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 That's what we're looking for. Um, you could Add. This is a ground cover and it will weep over the side. It's a, a juba. And you can put that in there with, uh, let me put this back with it. And it gives you a whole different look. So, you know, just play with it. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with taking a container to the nursery and fitting it in there and seeing what works for you. 
And you can use things like you know, the decorations that don't look quite great at home anymore. Use them in your pots because you you were going to throw them out anyway, right? And if they're tucked in there, you don't see the half the little beads are missing. So that's how and some of the basics. And let's talk about some ideas for any questions so far? Thank you for saying that because that was another comment I wanted to make is uh, because uh, you don't have as many choices in colors and as you do with the annuals coming in, your pot becomes more important. So look for um, unusual containers. They, they may not last all, they not last four months, but that's okay. If you use a wooden box or a, something that's more uh, fragile, you, you'll be done with it. And uh, you can try different containers. Paint your pots. These plastic pots and the plastic pots you buy um, at the local stores, they take spray painting real well. So, you know, I might paint that a vivid orange or yellow or chartreuse green. I love blue pots. I have too many blue pots at home. Because that just sort of brings another element into what you're doing. Um, Terracotta is great. You can paint it. Acrylic paint, spray paint, paint polka dots on them. You really want to get <laughs> So think about your pot as well, because that's part of the overall picture. So here's some uh, examples of different plants in different containers. The first one has the ornamental kale in it and variegated sedge, which is similar to this plant, except it looks more like a monkey grass. And uh, let's see if I can find one.
if you have a permanent planting like that, eventually it's going to get root bound, and you're going to have to do some medicine, doctoring to it. But it's going to it's going to eliminate a lot of work for a long time. So this is a very formal look, depending on your container and also the way it's, it's planted. Here's a very casual look in a wooden box. You've got sedum, uh, which is usually used as a ground cover, but it makes a nice hanging plant. The spiky, grassy stuff is, is blue fescue. That's good texture. It's got a little bit of an aster back there. Um, some million bells. Um, they look like the little petunias, calipoa. And, uh, and some cabbages in there, too. So mix it up depending on the look you want. Here's uh, in separate pots, you've got a, a basket of ornamental grasses with your mums. It's a nice backdrop. And the ornamental grasses doesn't have to be the tall Collins grass, Thomas grass. Um, they make they, they provide grasses in all heights, growth habits, colors, bloom heads. Just get out and look and see what's at the nursery or order it. This one uh, is a nice simple in a terracotta pot. You've got a couple of ornamental cabbages, some asters, and then uh, helichrysium, which is a common licorice plant. It's, called. it's a nice gray look. It kind of looks sort of like rosemary, but that gray color sets off the purples, and uh, it'll stay pretty small. And it can go in your yard. It's a perennial. Here we have some a smaller purple fountain grass. When you buy the grasses, you don't have to buy these plants here. I don't have to use that whole pot. I can cut it in half and make it smaller. It's not, I can have two pots that way. I've only bought one plant. This is the coral bells in the, uh, I think this is the sweet tea. So you get more brownish look. That's not a dying leaf, that's just the color it is. And then the violas, you can see they look like pansies, but they're, they're smaller. Here's another wash tub, some more purple fountain grass, some ornamental cabbage here, some coral bells cucumber there, and some creeping jenny. That's a ground cover. It's got a great chartreuse screen. It's very spreading, so you can get a lot of creeping jenny from the perches. But it takes a while to get to that point, so as long as you may have to pull some out now and then, but uh, makes a good hanging plant. One thing they teach us about containers you want three elements. You want um, a spiller, something growing over, softly growing over the top, a filler, which is your basic plant, and then a chiller or a thriller, something growing up tall and being high and dramatic. And that gives you that, you look at it, you go, that's complete. That's got what you want. Um, this is one that um, I saw ornamental millet, the red plant, growing up at the Jackson Demonstration Nurseries a couple of years ago, and, and it's, just, it's, it's just stunning. It's exotic looking, it's unusual. Uh, you may have trouble finding it, but you can always have them order it for you. It it's, grows these beautiful seed heads up there that look like catkins. That they stay all winter long, so you've got that visual interest. And then uh, this is some sedge, which is the stuff like this. Uh, growing out the side, it's filling over, and then your filler is a little pot of golden chrysanthemums. I think the red and the browns and the golds are just gorgeous. And that's that. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. You've been very attentive. On your sheet of paper, uh, I've listed some of the alternatives that you can get um, that go well with mums. And, um, Two things that uh, that I wanted to mention: the ornamental kale is not poisonous, but it is not highly edible. It's, it's nothing that you want to include in your salad. And um, the mums that you buy like this, once they're done, compost them or whatever you do with your spent plants. You can plant them in your yard, but they will never produce and never bloom uh, like you wanted them to. Oh, I disagree. With well, sometimes you get luck. <laughs> There's always a. I had one whole section in my garden for like three years. That was, they bloomed in the spring, I cut them down, and they bloomed again in the 
but you have to do a lot of work. It's like poncetta stuff. You have to cut them down and let them come back. It's like trying to keep poncetta from year to year. You can do it, but who wants to? Um, but there are hardy mumps, um, and you can ask the nursery. There are hardy mumps that are meant to be put in the landscape. Sometimes you get lucky and you buy one of those this time of year in the pots and you don't even know it. But for the most part, um, these are these are one and done plants. Thank you.